And thank you for the opportunity to be here. This has been a fantastic opportunity to get to know a campus that really is exceptional. And I wish there were many, many more of you around the world. It would make a difference. Um, wilderness and the geography of hope. As, Green, as, as Catherine mentioned, Greenland really made a difference for me because of the experience I had in one of the world's wildest places. Um, it affected me so much that I have written a book about it, and it's something that is very personal and um, tends to be a bit emotional. As a result of that, I'm really invested in the idea of, ge of, of wilderness. Not too long ago, last summer in fact, uh, I was at a barbecue at UC Davis, a bunch of faculty, uh, we're sitting around talking about a variety of things, and the fact that I'd been in Greenland and enjoyed wilderness came up. The conversation started and went probably about 30 seconds before one of my colleagues said, wilderness doesn't exist anymore. And um, we had had a few beers and a few glasses of wine, and the discussion became rather intense. His point was that because of climate change, there's not a single spot of the planet that has not been touched by human activity. That being the case, wilderness could not exist. We argued for a, a long time about what is wilderness without any real resolution happening. But after that conversation, I spent a considerable amount of time wondering exactly what does, do we mean by wilderness? What is it? One of the things that's come to um, be a prominent argument within the wilderness community are those who, on the outside of the wilderness community, are arguing along the lines of what my friend was saying, that if there isn't any wilderness anymore, we should be smart and go out and develop it intelligently so that it's used wisely for the future of humanity. I don't know if you have read E.O. Wilson's recent book, Half Earth. If you haven't, I strongly encourage you to read it. He has in there a very eloquent and aggressive defense for the concept of wilderness being considered something that is real and something that needs to be protected and the concept, the idea that we should go out and develop it is uh, abhorrent. I want to follow along, what, uh, along the lines of what E.O. Wilson said, but I want to take the argument in a different direction. I want to complement what he was saying but provide um, experiences that I've had in Greenland that I think speak to the issue of why wilderness needs to be preserved. I want to start with um, Wallace Stegner's Wilderness Letter. If you haven't heard of it, I strongly encourage you to find it. It was written in 1960 at a time when the Wilderness Act was being considered by Congress. A very strong contingent was arguing, a, a bill had been introduced that we should be set, set aside lands that would be preserved. There was a strong contingent arguing that should not happen, because if you did that, you would not be able to develop those lands anymore, and we would lose the opportunity to gain the wealth that's there. Arguments against that argument were often couched in terms of value. How do we value wilderness? Stegner wrote a letter that he made very explicitly clear in the beginning of uh, what he wrote that he was going to take a different tack. He wanted to make the point that wilderness should be considered important simply because it's wilderness. I want to read you an excerpt from, <clears throat> excuse me, a very long letter that he wrote. Um, it's become known as the Wilderness Letter or the Geography of Hope Letter. Without any remaining wilderness, we are committed wholly without chance for even momentary reflection and rest to a headlong drive into our technological termite life the brave new world of a completely man-controlled environment. We need wilderness preserved, <coughs> excuse me, as much, of it, it, as much of it as is still left, and as many kinds, because it was the challenge against which our character as a people was formed. The reminder and the reassurance that it is still there is good for our spiritual health, even if we never once in 10 years set foot in it. For us when we are young, the incomparable sanity it can bring briefly as vacation and rest into our insane lives. It is important to us when we are old simply because it is there. 
important that is simply as an idea. For wilderness can be a means of reassuring ourselves of our sanity as creatures, a part of the geography of hope. In that eloquent expression, I think he said what really needs to be said, and often is but not heard, about what wilderness is. It's the place to ground ourselves. It's the place we can get outside of who we are and see what the bigger world is. We can gain a perspective on what it is we exist within and what we're about. Many writers have addressed that issue with great eloquence. Um, Annie Dillard, Catherine Larson, um, Bill McKibben, Gretel Ehrlich, Terry Tempest Williams, just to name a very few. The tragedy is that the, those voices are seldom heard anymore just because of the intensity of the world we live in today. So many things are going on that need to be addressed. There is almost no room or certainly very little attention given to these particular arguments that are presented by these eloquent voices. This scares me. To me, this is wilderness and it needs to be taken care of. This is part of Greenland. But what is happening right now is represented on this graph. This is the only graph I'm going to show, for those of you who don't like graphs, but I think it's an important one. Um, horizontal axis is time from 1700 up to 2050. The vertical axis is millions of square miles of disturbed land on the Earth. And the data points that are shown here are taken from this publication, which is probably one of the most detailed examinations trying to establish what the history of disturbed lands is. The line at the top is the total land area of the planet. The red line is an exponential curve fit that I did to those points, and the two intersect at 2054. The implication is, and it's hard to avoid it, that by 2054, just a few decades away, there will not be an undisturbed square inch of land on the planet, except for those areas that we may have set aside. This matters to me because I, as I said, have been deeply affected by wilderness. I want to provide today a complimentary voice to those who have been speaking in support of there being more wilderness. And I want to do it through experiences in Greenland. I'm a geologist. I work with two Danish colleagues. We work in Greenland in an area that's here. And this is a blow up of that area. <clears throat> Excuse me. The area we cover is about 20,000 square miles. Um, it's bounded in the north by Disco Bay, in the south by Supertaban Mountain, the ice sheet on the east, and Davis Strait in the west. There are three main settlements in the region. Uh, Kangalusuak, which is a few hundred people, but if you fly from Copenhagen to Greenland, that's where you land. The Simut, which is located out here, it's a community of about 1,500 people. And Asia, which is up at the tip of that land, that's the largest community. It's about 3,100 people. There are a few other villages located along the coast here. Each one is maybe 20 to 50 people, and maybe a couple of hundred. It's a very, very unpopulated area, and very little of that land has ever been has ever experienced the presence of a human being. The way we work is that um, we go into a one of the villages convince some fishermen to take us out to where we want to work, drop us off, and then come back, promise to come back in a few weeks to a couple months. And so far they've done it. Occasionally we're helicoptered in, but usually it's through the fishermen. We go in with our own food, we have a radio for emergencies, but otherwise we have no contact with the outside world. It's a blessing. Um, it's a spectacular way to live and a, a way to get to know a wilderness terrain that um, is beautiful to see just going through it, but to know it, you have to live in it. The two guys I work with are Kai Sorensen and John Coastguard. John was the chairman of the department at the University of Aarhus, the geology department, and Kai was an associate director of the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland. If you ever go into a wilderness area like this, you have to go in with people with, who have a sense of humor. 
and these guys are that. Uh, you can you can tell from their faces there. Uh, it's one of the craziest photos of them that's around. Um, we have a wonderful time. We go there to look at the rocks, and these this is what some of the rocks look like. These blocks that are floating in this lithic river are 3.3 billion years old. The lithic river that you see flowing through that has disrupted this whole thing is 1.7 billion years old. These blocks record, at least in principle given their age, most of Earth history, at least when continents have been around. The bands that flow through here are the record of a mountain building event that took place 1.8 billion years ago. Um, the mountains that were built were probably as large as the Himalayas, maybe larger. They're completely gone. The only record of that event is what the rocks we work on, what we see. It's trying to make, tell the stories that are contained in those rocks. That's our job. That's what we do. Sometimes what we see is this, and it, it, when we see things like this, we go crazy because it's as though some incredibly wild painter has come through and just gone mad painting and painting and painting. The patterns are exquisite and they're everything. They can be this, they can be chaos, they can be almost anything. That we see them on the scale of a fin, um, their fingernail to the meters is this, and sometimes one fold like this will be an entire mountainside. One day I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was off by myself working a ridge that had rocks kind of like this. And uh, off to my right was a fjord. It was about a half a mile off. I was paying attention to my job. I was taking notes and collecting samples. And I looked, decided to take a break, turned to look at the fjord. It's beautiful blue water, brilliant blue, uh, blue sky, sunlight, no clouds. But along the edge of that blue fjord was the pinkest band I have ever seen. From a half a mile away, this thing was huge. It was, it was spectacular. I'd never seen anything like it. I didn't know what it was. But I had work to do. So I was paying attention to the rocks, but finally I said, I've got to see what this is. So I wandered down to where the, to that beach, and this is what I saw. And I didn't know if I was looking at red algae or sand. It was impossible to tell. I bent down, took a scoop in my hand, looked at it with my hand lens. You have to realize this extended all the way to the east as far as you could see as far to the west as you could see. It was a sand made of 100% garnets. Mm. The only thing that had disturbed them were these bird prints. It was spectacular. The garnets were the size of pinheads, the size of pebbles. I just stood there amazed, stunned. You know, it, the beauty of what you're seeing there transcends everything else you're doing. But the beauty is contained in almost everything you see, even in the rocks. When we collect samples, we um, take them back to the laboratory, slice them in thin slices, mount them on a piece of glass, grind them down until they're paper thin or thinner, so light can be transmitted through them. And then we look at it in a microscope. I've spent hours of my life looking at this thin section. Every change in color that you see, every change in pattern, everything that has to do with texture is telling you part of a history. And what our, what our effort is, is to read that history. We are the translators of the story that's contained here. But the beauty that's there is, it's expressed in so many ways. It's not just the rocks that affect us, it's the, the scenery as well. Um, this is standing at the edge of Disco Bay, the midnight sun. Um, at midnight, the winds cease. There's, it's absolute stillness there. All the dark things you see out there are icebergs from the size of your little finger to the size of this building or bigger. 
standing there is absolute silence. There's not a sound that you hear, unless you stay there long enough. And if you stay there for a while, you'll start hearing a click and a pop, a hum and a hiss, maybe a rumble. What you're hearing are the whales in the bay. I never expected to hear that. It was something that was a complete surprise. Sometimes what you see are scenes like this where orange and black lichen pepper the, the gray rocks we work on and they just punctuate the scene of the succulents and flowers growing up through cracks in the rocks. Sometimes what it's like is uh, fields of cotton grass like this, the mains blowing in the wind, just kind of shimmering. Blue waters in the background. And always, wherever you go, there's the presence of animals. Greenland is, a, is an untouched wilderness area. It, it really has seen virtually no human impact. As a consequence, the animals that populate the area aren't afraid of us, but they are wary of us. We've seen Arctic foxes, Arctic hare, uh, all kinds of bird life, uh, ptarmigans, peregrine falcons, scoters, loons, um, everything. But the thing that we seldom see are reindeer, the barren ground caribou. For some reason, even though there are tens of thousands of them there, they're exceedingly leery. If they know human beings are around, they don't hang out. They disappear. This particular beach, we were camped on that lake. This particular beach, um, we had walked across the afternoon before. There were no footprints there. I got up this morning, went down to brush my teeth, and the tracks of five barren ground caribou were across the mud. They had wandered right between the four tents that made up our camp. We didn't hear them, we didn't see them. They were just ghosts in the background. And that's the way they almost always are there. The landscape itself is um, uh, beautiful. Those are the mountains, the, the hills we have to climb over to see the geology. It's hills like this that have the huge folds. It's a moving experience to be able to be paid to go there and collect rocks. One of the things that's always present, though, no matter where you go, is the the ice sheet. This is the edge of the Greenland ice sheet. The scale here is difficult to gain, but this ridge up there is 20 miles away. The cliff face here is hundreds of feet. The, the crest of the ice sheet is over 6,000 feet in that particular place. The highest point in Greenland is over 12,000 feet, where the ice is about 10,000 feet thick. Um, the presence of the ice is something that always affects you but it affects you even when you can't see it. And the reason is all of the exposed land we walk over and do our geology in is land that was covered by ice 25,000 years ago. The entire landscape, every fjord finger, every bay, every ridge was sculpted by that. And you, as you walk over it, you cannot but be affected by the fact that that happened. Every outcrop is polished to a glassy surface except where the glass is spalled off by the incessant grinding of that ice as it moved over the rock. It's a, a, it's a beautiful place to be. I have a friend, her name is Elsa Marley. She's an artist. She uh, worked in West China, uh, Nepal, Tibet, and painted for many years in uh, Himalayas, Himalayas. And, um, Years ago, I was telling her I worked in Greenland and you know, we were studying rocks and they were kind of a mountain system much like the one you go to and paint in. And she got very excited. I explained to her that the rocks we were working on are in the core now, 30 miles down below the surface of the Himalayas, but we can see them on the surface today. So by going to Greenland, you can see what's in the heart of those, that mountain right now. She got very excited and said she wanted to go there. So Kai and I arranged a trip for her to uh, spend some time in Lulisat, which is on Disco Bay. And she was there for about 10 days. She was in her mid-70s. She was rather frail, but she did it. And it affected her in uh, very important ways. Um, this is one of the paintings she did. 
it um, was one of the abstracts. This is a more realistic representation of the things she saw. It has changed her life. She still talks about it. I, I encourage you to go to her website, look up the year 2009, which was when she was there, and you can see all the, the paintings and prints that she did. My point in bringing this up is that the experience of place there changes how you view what you do, who you are, and for whatever creative outlet you have, it'll shape it. For me, it's storytelling. So I want to tell you a couple of stories about Greenland and, and my experience of place there. One um, is uh, best called, I suppose, birds and bird cries and myths. Um, the way we do field work there is in a, uh, because there's so much water and, and fjords everywhere, uh, we have a base camp, we have a little zodiac inflatable boat, it's about 12 feet long, it has an outboard, um, and we plan all of our trips using air photos. We can, the maximum range is about 30 miles. On one air photo we saw when we were planning this, there was this white splotch that had no feature at all. There was about a half a mile in diameter and we couldn't figure out how it fit into the geology. We decided we had to go there and see it. So this one day, it was a, a beautiful day, got in the boat and headed off. We, when we got there, this is what we saw. And for those of us working on crystalline rocks, really old bedrock stuff, it was kind of a disappointment, but it was spectacularly cool. Um, this was a bay, the water was about three inches deep at its deepest. It was rimmed by glacial outwash that had formed about 20,000 years ago when the ice was just beginning to retreat from the region. The air photo had been taken when the tide had been out and the muds that made up the bay floor had dried and they had dried to the same color as this. So we thought that's cool. Um, we now know what's going on. The, the tide was coming in and filling up the bay. We decided we would do some work on this little peninsula of rock we had grounded the boat on, spent some time doing that for a few minutes, when suddenly Kai yells, the boat, the boat. We turned around and um, we hadn't tied the boat, it would, we just beached it. The tide had come up and lifted the boat, and was carrying it out into the fjord. At that point the fjord was about two miles wide. Um, Kai ran out, grabbed the rope, pulled the boat back in. We quickly collected our samples, jumped in the boat, and headed back out into the fjord. The intent was that what we would do um, was, because we were so far from our camp, so ride the tide back in. So we headed back out into the fjord, when suddenly this very strange sound started around us that we did not, could not fathom what it was. It started out as kind of a sonorous singing, but with shrieking and wailing in it, and it sounded as though it was, it was very feminine. And it sounded as though there was a collection of women somewhere in distress, but at the same time singing. As I said, the fjord was two miles wide, and at the far end of it, uh, or the other side, was this cliff that was almost a thousand feet. It was in shadow and we couldn't see anything. As we went out into the fjord and we had heard this sound, John stopped the boat and we debated among, amongst ourselves, what should we do? What's going on here? Um, the nearest settlement was about 40 miles up the fjord. It was 200 people. And there, it seemed inconceivable there would be a collection of women somehow out in the fjord there. That just didn't make any sense. But if there's distress, you have to do something. We were the only people around. We decided, okay, we'll, we'll go see what's going on. We headed off toward the cliff at top speed. That wailing, sonorous sound slowly morphed into a staccato, broken sound of bird cries. We went for probably another minute and um, looked up at the cliff and realized at the top there were hundreds of gulls swinging back and forth across the top screaming. There must have been a rookery up there and whether the noise of our outboard or a 
an Arctic fox was up stealing eggs. We, we never found out, we never know. We laughed at ourselves for being fooled, turned the boat back around, and went back to where we had been. And as we did, the sound came back. That shrieking, wailing, sonorous, uh, captivating sound. It stayed with us for probably another five or 10 minutes and it just slowly evaporated. I could give you the scientific explanation of what went on, but that's not what was interesting. What was interesting was that I am convinced what we experienced was the, the sirens, that half woman, half bird creature from Greek mythology. We had experienced what Odysseus had his men tie him to the mast of a ship to hear. Well, they stuck wax in their ears and rode past them 3,200 years ago. It would be impossible to experience something like that in any place that isn't wild. It takes a truly wild setting to let you find things like that. What that taught me was that the science I was doing, although it, it has value, is not complete without the presence of mythology, myths. Myths tell us what we feel, what our experiences are, and give, them, uh, give us a way of communicating what we have known to those who come after us and those who are around us. Science will be incomplete until it integrates myth and mythology into what it does. Same thing is true of mythology. It will be incomplete until it integrates something rational from the scientific part of the world in how it presents things. It's a new way of telling stories. I don't know what form it will take and how it could materialize, but it's something that we need to be thinking about. Another story I want to tell you about I call Tide, um, because it's about a tidal experience. Um, when we work out there, as I said, we're usually working from a Zodiac, this inflatable boat. If you haven't seen a Zodiac, it's, there's a pontoon that's along either side of it, and the pontoons come to a point in the bow. There are inflatable benches that go across that provide some rigidity. The particular way the three of us work is, um, I don't know how this happened, but John is the captain, and John sits at the outboard, and he always sits on the right-hand side. It's just the way he functions. Kai and I sit in the bow to hold the bow down when we're going at top speed. I'm always on the left, and Kai is always on the right. Just tradition. The, along the top of the pontoon is a small rope. And so as you're going out in high speed riding on this boat, um, you often hold on to this thing. All of our supplies are provided by the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland. And they have a bunch of rules, they tell you, that you have to follow if you're out on the water. And we seldom do. One of the rules is that you have to wear a survival suit. The reason you wear a survival suit is that the water in the fjords is about 38 degrees and so it's pretty cold. And you get dumped into the water and survival isn't very long. The survival suits give you an additional 30 to 45 minutes. But the survival suits, for those of you who have worn, worn them know, they're incredibly cumbersome. You put these things on and off, it takes minutes. We're getting in and out of the boat all the time. And we just, no, we're not gonna do that. So the survival suits were sitting at our feet. This particular day, the place we wanted to go was at the eastern end of Tunertok Island. The photos that I showed at the beginning of those rocks and folds came from that place. Tunertok had not been visited by a geologist ever, and it was a place at that time completely unknown. We had no idea what we were going to see. But we were excited about it because it was in an important part of the geological framework we were studying. We jumped in the boat, got in. Um, this is the day. It was stunningly beautiful. Water was absolutely flat. There was a swell, a very most gentle swell moving through 
uh, coming from the Davis Strait almost 100 miles away. That was the only thing that was on the water. John loves it when it's like that, because he can fire up the outboard and go as fast as he wants. So we cranked the thing up, and we took off. Tunertok is an island, it's about 20 miles long, four miles wide, it sits on the north side of our fair Seagraphic fjord. Behind it is a lattice work of fjords that are, extend 20 to 40 miles back to the inland ice. So it's really a water-rich place. The only way the water in those fjords can get out during low tide or back in and replenished at high tide is through the passages at either end of the island. The passages are narrow. The one on the eastern end, which we were going to be approaching, was a few hundred feet wide. It's about a hundred feet deep. We were taking, we were screaming down the fjord and just enjoying the scenery. It was, um, you get into a kind of a mesmerized state when you're flying over water like this and watching this landscape go by. To the left of us is a cliff that's 1,400 feet. It's almost like El Capitan flooded. It's, it's like being in Yosemite, just water rich. Um, we're enjoying the scene. Kai and I aren't saying anything. We, we're in this nebulous mind space when suddenly the boat stops. I mean, literally, it just stops. It swings off to the left, starts going into this incredible gyration, and Kai and I go overboard. Just as we hit the water, we grab the ropes, and we're able to pull ourselves back in. We scramble and look back at John, like, what are you doing? And John is laying on the floor of the boat, face down. He has the handle of the outboard in his hand. The blade is in the air, screaming. And we had no idea what was going on. John scrambles back up, put, puts the outboard back in, throttles down, and the, the boat is going all over the place. He, the look on his face was one of the most stunned looks I've ever seen on John, and John is not the kind of guy who gets surprised by much of anything. He looks around and then he just points and says, the tide. Without knowing it, we had come to that eastern passage between Tunertok and the mainland. The, we were at the height of an ebbing tide, and flowing through that passageway was the most incredible rapids you have ever seen. There were standing waves, huge boils coming up. Um, it was chaos. John was having a really difficult time controlling the boat. And I'm beginning to think, this may be it. We, we may die here. In that state of mind, you become acutely aware of threat. As we were trying to deal with this incredible bucking ride, we became aware of something else. It had been there all the time, but we hadn't noticed it. There was a thunderous sound in the air that we thought at first was lightning, and, but we looked up and you know these are the clouds. There was no, there were no thunderheads anywhere. We, you, know, you could feel the concussion from the sound waves hitting your skin. You could feel, um, the, the, you know, the boat vibrating, and as though the three of us had a single mind, we looked down to the floor of the boat because the sounds were coming up through the water. We didn't know what it was at first. It just kept going and going, this booming, pounding, thunderous thing. When I realized what we were hearing, a hundred feet down was the sound of massive boulders propelled by the outgoing tide, bouncing along the floor, hitting the bedrock. I'm not a humble guy, but at that point, I was very, very humbled. It was experiencing riding the back of that thing, that power that was surrounding you completely, made you realize how incredibly frail we are. We were riding the back of a power that is everywhere and it's always around us, 
Usually, though, it's concealed. It's in some kind of camouflaged state. But much of what we do, building buildings and uh, what we do with our lives, is trying to protect ourselves from that, that power. But it, th it was there, it was raw, and we were riding the back of it. We obviously survived, hit the, the outcrop we wanted to hit, and um, went back at the, at the at a neutral tide, thinking, finally. Um, but on the way back, and, and for a long time after that, one of the things that I be became aware of is the fact that it's not, you know, th this experience of having that power threaten you is something we should be aware of all the time because of our vulnerability. The universe, nature does whatever it's capable of doing in any particular place. And if we had died there, it wouldn't have been a gentle wilderness defiled. It wouldn't have been nature red in tooth and claw. It would be neither and both at the same time. You begin to realize in that kind of setting, there, is, there are no absolutes in the world. It's simply a coincidence of circumstances that allows whatever to happen, happen. Every star that's out there in the universe happens because of the circumstances that at that particular place allow a star to form. Sometimes a planet forms. Sometimes that planet will have a layer of water on it with a place in which you can live. It's a paper thin envelope within which we exist. Absolutely paper thin. But within that thing, all the possible things that can happen given the coincidence of circumstances will happen. It's as though that nature is experimenting all the time. And everything it creates and generates, all these little experiments are going to be there. But they will never repeat. Evolution, you know, life began 3.8 billion years ago on this planet with single-celled things and evolved into the things we are right now. Each one of us is one of those experiments. Each one of us is an experiment nature or wildness or the universe has conducted. And yet we think about that. We wonder about this nature, this universe we're in, which ironically, it seems, also implies we are the universe thinking about itself, trying to understand itself. If you go into a wild place, <clears throat> excuse me, a wild place like this, you get a chance to see it firsthand. If you live there, you get to taste it, you get to smell it, hear it. To me, these are the things that make up what is a geography of hope, or at least some of the things that are a geography of hope. There's one more tale I want to tell you. And I think what it shows is something about this geography of hope, wilderness, that we need to take very, very seriously. That's the, the folly we, per, we act out in many of the things we do. Scattered throughout the Greenland landscape, our bones. It's a place that's, un because it's untouched, nothing is cleaned up. Nothing is made nice. Nothing is made to be gentle. It's just what is. Sometimes, well not sometimes, almost every day we run across reindeer antlers. Reindeer shed the antlers every year. So these things are every place. But they're part of that cycle of life they lead. Every one of these things that we saw was the end of a chapter in a life. You walk around that landscape and you get a chance to be in touch with that. The landscape is littered with bird bones, often insinuated into the, the way the tundra grows. Sometimes we'd come across Arctic fox skulls. I have an intact one sitting on my desk. The presence of these things on the surface is just an integral part of what happens. It makes you appreciate the vibrancy and the richness of what's there just because of its resilience. The life you think that 
would have a difficult time living above the Arctic Circle in this harsh environment is thriving. It's, it's happy there. It's evolved there. But one of the things I should not have seen is this. The way things usually worked at camp was that Kai was the designated cook. I shouldn't say designated, he took it over. He didn't like the way I cooked. He didn't like the way John cooked. So he became the cook. We were out in the field one day. Um, it had been a long day. Went to the cook tent and um, Kai started to cook up whatever he was going to cook up. I decided I just wanted to take a walk. So headed out of the cook tent up a few little bays and um, came upon this. And I was floored by it. It's a foot and a half thick little muffin of tundra with the grasses growing on the top. We know from the location we were, at this point we were about 10 miles from the inland ice. That means that the ice front was out here about 6,000 years ago. So that tundra, the base of it down here, was about 6,000 years old. The bones were about halfway up in it, which meant they probably around 3,000 years old. Greenland was settled. The earliest settlements in Greenland date from 4,500 years ago. It's the last settled landmass on the planet. The age of those bones means it's conceivable that reindeer met a Stone Age hunter. One of the things that made us think that was the presence of this stone in the same layer. But we didn't excavate it to see because it was just too holy. It was like a small shrine to the death of this reindeer. We just let it be. But what was disturbing about this scene was I, I was standing at the edge of a bay. This is the inland edge of that bay. The tide was out. The bay muds were off to my right, just succulently glistening in the low, low sunlight. It's, the tide was out. The, the edge of the wa water was about 100 feet from where I was. Little icebergs floating by. It was a very beautiful scene, but very disturbing, because there were stones scattered all over the uh, muds, different sizes, some small, some large. The largest ones all had a little cap of tundra like this on them. Each cap had steep sides, and each top was at exactly the same elevation all across the bay. Geologically, or whatever ology you're interested in, you know tundra does not grow like that, these little muffins on stones. It forms planes that extend out. I then suddenly realized each one of those little things, incredibly delicate, had to have been an erosional remnant. That tundra plain that is off to my left went all the way out to the high tide point in where that bay was at some point in the past. For some reason, the high tide level had to have risen and was eating back this thing that had been growing for 6,000 years. The only way that could have happened is the following scenario. When the tide comes in and goes, the, the fjord goes all the way to the inland ice. Under normal circumstances, the ice is melting. It's adding water to the fjord. But it's a small trickle. Small rivers come out of the base of the, the ice sheet. When climate change was accelerated by human activity, the ice starts melting at an incredible rate. The rivers of water coming out from the ice sheet now, you would not believe. At high tide, the amount of water coming from the ice sheet is causing the water level, the high tide level, to rise. And that is causing the erosion of all of this. 
I was watching a landscape dissolve. It was going away because of what was happening thousands of miles away. The thing that affected me most about this, <clears throat> I mean, other than for me, the, the obvious message of a human impact on a pristine land that I loved so much, was the land didn't care. I was the one standing there caring about this. The landscape didn't. It was responding in a natural cycle, going from deposition to erosion. It was just responding. No matter what we do, it's going to do that. We are the ones who bring feeling to this. It was very sobering to realize that because it was this that made me realize that argument I was having back when we weren't all that sober about whether or not wilderness exists. He was right. He was absolutely right. Even some of the wildest places on the planet, <clears throat> excuse me, are being modified by what we've done. They are not pristine in the sense of not having been touched by human beings. That does not make them not wild. And it does not make them not wilderness. The only way they become not wilderness if, is if you define wilderness as being that place that only has never been touched by a human activity. That's not the original definition of wilderness. Wilderness was defined, it comes from an old English word, which means where only wild animals live. Those places can have places where human beings have wandered. There are places where human beings go in and have hunt, hunted. There are places where there may be human trails going through. The important thing is what they give to us, the experience we can have there, the experience of what's wild, unshaped, unengineered, back to that thing that Wallace Stegner was talking about. The important thing, I now believe, is that we, all of us who consider wild lands important, do everything we possibly can to make experiences of those places personal. We go out into them and discover them. We live in them if it's possible to get out in them and live in them, we do that. And we do it without, we, we do it in ways that, that remove as many boundaries from the experience of place as we possibly can. Part of that means going out there and living it for a long period of time, maybe in a sleeping bag or maybe not, maybe walking through it barefoot. Whatever it is, it's feeling it, tasting it, experiencing the sense of place that that can be. If we do that, then each of us, through whatever creative means we have available to us and are inspired by, make up stories. Or we do paintings or drawings, think of songs, manufacture dances. And then what we do is come back and share those. I think if we do that enough, it may be possible to divert that curve that I showed you earlier, where in 2054, we lose all wilderness. I'm not hopeful that that's actually going to be the case, but it's something that we can do. But if we don't do that, if, if we can't stop that curve from intersecting the total global land area, we will at least have preserved a record of personal experiences each of us has had in the wilderness, what it has provided us. And if we do that, if we're able to do that well, we will have provided for future generations what can be their geography of hope. So that's my experience of Greenland. I want to thank you for the time to share it with you.